Throughout the history of Canada, certain events are always highlighted and are well enshrined in our collective memory. Be it the War of 1812, the Battle of Vimy Ridge, the creation of Canada in 1867, or the 1972 Summit Series. However, there is so much more to our history and the history of the land before Canada existed. This podcast endeavors to tell those stories, looking at chapters of our history that may be regionally well-known, but not necessarily well-known nationwide. And while much of the history of Canada is solidly rooted in fact, there are a number of stories which leave more questions than answers. There is a part of the history of Canada, even the land before Canada as a country existed, where there are mysteries, legends, myths, and stories that shiver the soul. These stories are just as important as the ones that we all know about, and we will be telling one of those stories today. Welcome to Canadian History After Dark. Imagine sitting in your quiet house when you hear a loud noise coming from an unoccupied room. Something moves violently from the shelf, launching itself onto the floor. A foul smell emanates from some point you aren't able quite to locate. Things hover in the middle of the living room as though they're being held in the air by a person. The lights flicker on and off, and not just the lights in the room, but any candles too. Imagine something even more violent, like an unseen force pushing you. Someone unseen grabbing you and throwing you like you're nothing more than a pillow. Now picture yourself in a small town in rural Nova Scotia in the late 1800s. And this happens to a young girl who is described by an acquaintance as, quote, Her disposition is naturally mild and gentle. She can at times, however, be very self-willed and is bound to have her own way when her mind is made up. If asked to do anything that she does not feel like doing, she becomes very sulky and has to be humored at times to keep peace in the family. However, all things considered, she is a good little girl and has always borne a good reputation in every sense of the word." Unquote. For one family in 1878, this is claimed to be their reality. This is the story of the great Amherst mystery. This mystery is a ghost tale, but one that is yet to be definitively proven one way or another. It was an extremely well-documented situation by a number of third parties from outside the home and outside the community. We will talk about the facts as they were presented, and from there, we can start to look at whether this is reality or fiction. Young Esther Cox lived in this town that is just inside the Nova Scotia border with New Brunswick, near the Cumberland Basin. In 1881, the first census year after the events that took place, the population was 4,457. It was the typical town of the time in Nova Scotia, with one exception. Esther lived in Amherst with her older sister Olive and her husband Daniel. Also living in the house were Olive and Daniel's two young children, Olive and Esther's brother William, and their sister Jane, as well as Dan's brother, John. Needless to say, it was a very packed house. During the summer of 1878, a young man by the name of Bob McNeil took young Esther out for a ride in the country on his carriage. He went to what he thought was a secluded wooded area and pulled out a gun. It was obvious his intentions were not good and she refused his advances. Before things could turn violent, another buggy came rumbling down the road. This was enough of a deterrent to McNeil, and he turned the buggy around. He took Hester back to her home. The whole situation left young Esther extremely distraught, and it is said she spent the night crying herself to sleep. Nothing more came of the situation for a few days. Then things started to happen around the home. The first thing to happen was the sound of what was a mouse in the room Esther shared with her sister Jane. The girls thought it had gotten into one of the mattresses, but a search yielded no mouse. Then they figured they had located the source of the sound, a box in the bedroom. The two girls went over to the box to check if there was a mouse in there. And the box instead went flying up at the girls. Of course, they screamed, and Daniel came to investigate. They told him what was happening, 
but the concerns were dismissed as their imaginations just playing tricks on them. The next night, Esther had retired for the evening early, saying she had a fever. In the middle of the night, she shot up for bed and cried for her sister. Jane awoke, and what she saw terrified her. Esther's face was red, her eyes bulging as though she had been choked. Jane called for help, and Dan and Olive came to the room. They got Esther back into bed and noticed her hands and feet were swollen. The family reported a sound like a clap of thunder in the room, then three cracks coming from under the bed. Esther went limp as though she had passed out, and her color went back to normal. As one could imagine, the family was bewildered about what had happened, but without any way to figure out what was happening. So they too went back to sleep. The next day, Esther was back to normal. No one could explain what had happened, and Esther herself had no recollection. So no one brought the issue up to her. The family thought it was just a bizarre occurrence and probably gave no more thought to it than perhaps a shared dream or nightmare. Then four nights later, while Jane and Esther were in bed, something happened again. This time, Jane was still awake when things started to go crazy. The bed sheets went flying off of both of the beds, becoming crumpled into a corner. Olive and Dan came running into the room when the girls screamed. Before they'd even gotten there, Jane fainted from fright. Like the previous time, Esther's face was blood red and her hands and feet were swollen. Olive put the sheets back on the bed, but they flew off again. And then a pillow went flying from under Esther's head and hit John, her younger brother. The family got the sheets back onto the bed and sat on them to keep them from flying off. As though whatever spirit was tormenting them was upset it wouldn't be able to have any more fun that night, there were three loud knocks under the bed and everything stopped. The family called upon the town doctor and explained to him what was happening. The doctor laughed off the incidents and said he would prove that it was all fakery by coming to the house that night and observing Esther. The events of that night were recounted by Hammerson Peters, a writer for Mysteries of Canada. Quote, The doctor arrived at the Teed house at 10 that evening. He immediately examined Esther, who had already been in bed for an hour, and deduced that she had suffered a tremendous shock of some kind. As he spoke, Esther's pillow moved laterally until only one corner was tucked beneath the girl's head. The doctor watched in amazement as the pillow returned to its former position without any external assistance. Did you all see that? the doctor exclaimed. It went back again. So it did, replied John Teed, but if it moves out again, it will not go back, for I intend to hold on to it, even if it did bang me over the head last night. No sooner had he said this than the pillow moved laterally again, as if to challenge the young man. Though John gripped it with all his might, the pillow subsequently slid back under Esther's head, as if it had encountered no resistance at all. John's hair stood on end. Shortly thereafter, loud knocks sounded from beneath the bed. Although the doctor examined the area from which the sounds had originated, he was unable to determine their source. He proceeded to walk about the room. The knocking followed him, sounding from the floor beneath him. After about a minute of knocking, the bed sheets once again flew into a corner of the room. Immediately, a scratching sound emanated from the wall behind the bed. When everyone in the room looked to ascertain the source of the noise, they saw that a disturbing message had been carved into the wall. Unquote. That message? Esther Cox, you are mine to kill. The events continued throughout the following weeks. The doctor, Dr. Karit, visited on more than one occasion. He even prescribed a sedative for Esther, which was to no avail. If anything, this would make the events become more exacerbated. In addition to the loud bangs, which Dr. Karit described as like a sledgehammer on the roof, the supposed spirits would respond intelligently to questions with a rapping noise. The events weren't just confined to the house. Rather, they only happened in the house, but the whole neighborhood knew something was happening. The loud bangs that accompanied the episodes could be heard, it is said, over 200 yards away. And the banging sounds began to be heard at all times of the day. After about a month of these noises, Reverend Dr. Edwin Clay came to visit. Reverend Clay was a Baptist clergyman, well-known in the area, who came to see what was happening after reading the accounts that had been published 
first in the Amherst Gazette, then later in other papers. In his book, The Great Amherst Mystery, Walter Hubble wrote, quote, When he left the house, he was fully satisfied that Esther did not in any way produce the sounds herself, and that the family had nothing whatever to do with them. He, however, agreed with Dr. Carit in his theory that her nerves received a shock of some kind, making her, in some mysterious manner, an electric battery. His idea being that invisible flashes of lightning left her person, and that the sounds, which every person could hear so distinctly, were simply minute peals of thunder. So convinced was he that he ascertained the cause, and that there was no deception in regard to the manifestations of the power, that he delivered lectures on the subject and drew large audiences." Unquote. There we have it. Mystery solved, static electricity with charges so powerful it creates its own thunder emanating from a person and no harm coming to the person or surrounding area from such a powerful static electric charge. If only that were the case. In addition to Reverend Clay, the pastor of the Wesleyan Church in Amherst, Reverend Temple, also came to visit Esther. He claimed to have seen a bucket of cold water come to a rolling boil while it was standing on the kitchen table. Soon the people of the town and from around the area came to visit the home. Crowds would be so large that on some occasions the Amherst police would have to intervene in order to keep the peace. Then in December of 1878, everything seemed to stop. Suddenly, Esther had come down with diphtheria. In bed with the illness for two weeks, the activity ceased in the home. After she started to recover, she went to her other sister's home in Sackville, New Brunswick, to recuperate for another few weeks. While she was there, nothing further occurred, either in Amherst or Sackville. It appeared everything was done and over with. Esther returned home after around two weeks in Sackville, and it seemed like it was all over. Then things took an extremely dark turn for the worse. Hubble wrote, quote, On returning to Daniel's cottage, the most startling and peculiar features of the power took place. One night, while in bed with her sister Jenny in another room, their room having been changed in the hope the power would not follow them, she, meaning Esther, told Jenny that she could hear a voice informing her that the house was to be set on fire that night by a ghost. The voice stated it had once lived on the earth, but had been dead for some years, and was now only a ghost. Unquote. The family was called into the room, and Esther repeated to them what she had just told Jenny. Then the family claims lit matches appeared to uh, come out of nowhere falling out of thin air onto the bed, around eight or nine of them magically appearing, and they were quickly put out before they could night anything. The noises then returned as well. Over the next few weeks, there were a number of instances where fires would appear in the house, be it a burning dress or more matches, or in one case, a fire in the basement. Things came to a head in the Teed household one night. We returned to Hubble's book for the description, quote, as if to pile horror upon horror, one night while Esther and the entire family were sitting in the parlor, the ghost became visible to her. When she saw him first, she started to her feet and seemed about to fall dead from fright. Recovering her strength and self-possession in a moment, however, she pointed to a distant corner of the room with her trembling hand and exclaimed in a hoarse and broken voice, Look there! Look there! My God, it is the ghost! Don't you all see him too? There he stands! See, his eyes are glaring, and he laughs, and says, I must leave this house tonight, or he will kindle a fire in the loft under the rook and burn us all to death. Oh, what shall I do? Where shall I go? The ground is covered in snow, and yet I must not remain here, for he will do what he threatens. He always does. Unquote. With this turn of events, Esther would leave the home that night, and she was taken in by John White and his family. Esther would be in the White home for around two weeks before the haunting started again. Items would disappear, matches falling from the ceiling, small fires starting in other rooms, but the Whites weren't about to be intimidated. 
John came up with the idea of having Esther work with him in his tavern. There, however, the troubles continued. This included things like doors being opened and closed, and in one case, lifted right off the hinges. In one extremely frightening incident, a whittling knife went from the hand of the Whites' young son, Frederick, through the air and into Esther's back. The knife would be pulled out and Frederick would close it up and put it back into his pocket when the knife would come flying out and go right back into Esther's back. By March of 1879, Esther would find herself in St. John, New Brunswick. There, the case would be investigated by a number of people, including those who were professed to be experts in the occult. These experts would witness the various manifestations firsthand, how the spirit affecting her would make her hands and feet swell, how it would answer questions by rapping on a surface or talking through Esther, and the way matches would appear out of thin air. Esther would return to Amherst after around six weeks in St. John and stayed with the Van Amberg family. While she was there, the activity slowly faded away and eventually completely stopped. After another eight weeks, Esther would return to her home with her sister Olive and brother-in-law Daniel and return to work at John White's Tavern. It appeared everything had returned to normal. It was at that time that Walter Hubble would make his way to Amherst. Hubble was an actor and an amateur paranormalist. He had heard of the great Amherst mystery and had been in correspondence with White and Teed about the situation. He had already proposed to White that they go on a lecture tour, talking about the mysteries, bringing Esther with them, in case the spirit that was haunting her decided to manifest itself. Hubble spent six weeks investigating the case. He saw firsthand the events people were describing, and he interviewed a number of the witnesses, including Reverends Clay and Temple, Dr. Carit, the family, and the Whites. The events continued to grow over the weeks that Hubble was there. Then it was decided that Esther had to leave the home. That would be when Hubble, White, and Cox embarked on their speaking tour. This speaking tour would last just two engagements, with the crowds calling it a fraud and a hoax, and in one case pelting them with stones as they left the hall where they had been speaking. Cox returned to Amherst. She went to live and work for a man named Arthur Davison. Shortly after she started working there, his barn burned down. Many suspected it was the spirits again tormenting her. But Davison pushed for a charge of arson to be investigated. Esther would be convicted of the arson and sentenced the four months in prison. While she was released after just one month of her sentence having been served, it seemed to have been enough that the spirits left her completely alone. Not a single instance of the activity was reported the entire time that she was incarcerated. It appeared that Esther was free of her spirits. Not much is written of her after this time. She would get married twice, had a son with each of her two husbands, and moved to Massachusetts with her second husband, where she would pass away in 1912 at the age of 52. Within a year of visiting Esther, Hubble would publish his book, from which the whole case received its name, The Great Amherst Mystery. It was extremely popular and sold over 55,000 copies. It definitely helped align the pockets of Hubble himself. However, just how much of that book was fiction and how much was fact? Hubble's first edition of the book said the story had been completely corroborated by the people of Amherst. However, there were some concerns with that statement. In his book, The Deceivers, Lies of the Great Impostors, which was released in 1966, Egon Larsen, a German science journalist, noted that not a single person named in Hubble's book 
was ever verifying the statements that were attributed to them. The quotes that Hubble provided from newspapers at the time may never have been actually published. Larson claimed Hubble himself embellished the facts to help sell books. And there's even a letter in which Davison, the man whose barn had burnt down, says that Hubble painted the facts up to make the book sell. So who was telling the truth about everything? There's no copies that are readable online that I was able to find of the Amherst Gazette from that period. There are copies of the newspaper on microfilm, but unfortunately I was not able to get access to them while I was writing and researching the scripts. Now, the time that this was all taking place was the start of the movement of spiritualism in North America. This was a time when holding seances were commonplace, and people would turn to mediums for assistance. It would be in the same time period, roughly, that the Winchester Mansion in California would be built, where Lady Winchester, receiving the advice of a medium that said she could never stop building the house. Now, ghost stories were at their pinnacle at this time, thanks to well-documented books that were written in England, Canada, and the United States by very prominent authors. For example, it's a common Christmas tale now, but the Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens was a ghost story at the time, not a story of Christmas. But fakery was also rampant. Ghost photographs were easily faked, because with photography just entering the mainstream, people would believe images that they saw were real. Sleight of hand, tricks of light and photography, and an audience that wanted to believe would see more and more people thinking that this was all on the up and up. But at the same time, you had people like Hubble, who heard the story of Esther Cox and came to Amherst with the idea of making a dollar off the poor girl. Like, we can't really sugarcoat it too much. He came without any prompting or assistance, and this was a man who first instinct was to write a book, uh, rather publish his diary of everything that he encountered while he was there for six weeks, and by all accounts, he embellished the record. And let's look at the events that directly preceded the supposed haunting of Esther Cox. She was almost raped at gunpoint by a person who was considered to be a family friend. She was only saved because there was somebody who came by who would have been a witness or could have prevented it. Now, one of the spirits who talked to her or through her was named Bob Nickel. A lot of people have noted the man who attempted to assault Esther was named Bob McNeil. A similarity in the names can't be overlooked. It could be said that the family and Esther were behind the whole thing as a way to cover up how the trauma was affecting the young woman. Remember, this was 1978. Mental health wasn't exactly something that was taken seriously at the time. Today, a person has things at their disposal, such as victim services, counseling, mental health professionals, and so on. None of that existed then. Someone who is deemed to be insane would basically be shipped off to a hospital for the rest of their life, where they would be lucky if all that happened was they were kept in a trance-like state by the administration of copious amounts of laudanum. For those who don't know what that is, basically an alcoholic drink made from opium. Yeah, that was the thing. The whole event could be easily attributed to a young woman dealing with the trauma and the family doing what they could do to cover for her so she wouldn't be committed. But things just snowballed and it would be after she spent some time in prison that she could let the whole story die down and move on to having a normal life. Still, what if the story is true? What if what was recorded down was just embellished by Hubble but actually happened to some extent? It is a possibility, however unlikely. But, as the famous quote goes, once every logical solution has been exhausted, the logical, no matter how impossible, becomes the only logical solution. Coming up Sunday, we'll be continuing our look at the War of 1812 on Canadian History with Stephen Wilson. We will start with the Battle of Chrysler's Farm, then talk about how the British laid waste to the area east of the Niagara River. 
We are starting to come to the close of our look at the War of 1812. In the coming weeks, we will be talking about the Battle of Lundy's Lane, the Chesapeake Campaign and the myths surrounding it, and the peace that came from the Treaty of Ghent. And next Wednesday, in our next episode of Canadian History After Dark, we will examine the explosion that killed Peter Verrigan, a leader in the Dugabor community in Western Canada. Was it a tragic accident or an assassination? Look for us on Patreon. Join our community where you can get ad-free access to our podcast. You can also get weekly access to weekly live discussions on the History of Canada. Like and follow us on social media. This includes Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. Every day we bring you our This Date in Canadian History feature, plus a lot more. Check out our YouTube and become a subscriber. We will be bringing more and more video content in the coming weeks. Speaking of video content, we have a Kickstarter for our documentary series that will tell some of the stories of Canada that are better told visually rather than just by audio. And follow along the podcast on your favorite platform. We bring you two episodes a week. One is Canadian History After Dark, and the other is our ongoing anthology series that looks at various events from Canadian history that may not be as well-known nationwide as they are regionally. And thank you for listening to Canadian History After Dark.